My name is Jacob Schrader. I grew up in the Midwest, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, and then spent a fair amount of time in Omaha, Nebraska before moving out here to Seattle. And I am 31 years old. So uh, my, my name is Brooke Rose Shear, and I am from Seattle, Washington. I'm five foot six. I'm a Virgo. My name is Alyssa James. I'm from Colorado and New York and live in Seattle now, and I'm 42. My name is Derek Anthony Jones. I'm 37 years old, was born in Oakland, then to Alameda, then to Guam, then to the Philippines, and then finally to Hawaii, where I turned five. And then from five to 20, I lived in Mililani and other parts of Oahu. After that, when I turned 20, I moved to LA with three of my friends and we started a band. I lived in LA for four years. And then after LA, I moved back home for about three months, saved some money, home being Hawaii. And then I moved to Seattle in 2008, February, which was so long ago. I'm coming up on 12 years here now. Jeff Wilkinson, I've lived in Portugal, a lot of places in the US. Uh, and I'm 35 years old. Uh, my name is Andrew. I am 30 years old, and I'm a born and raised Seattleite. My name is Joni. I grew up in Connecticut, and then I lived in St. Louis, Missouri for 10 years, and I've been here in Seattle for four and a half years. I'm 32. I mean, like the biggest kind of like influence, I went to like a private high school where it was just dudes. Uh, but for the most part, when I was with my group of white friends who came from middle class families from like East Side Kirkland and stuff, I was generally put in situations where they were okay. But I remember this one interaction when I was uh, dealing with a cop in Medina with uh, me and my high school buddy, Sean, at the time. Uh, we were just kind of wandering around his neighborhood and he's a generally just a middle cut class uh, white kid from a nice middle class family and I'm living in I'm not living in there but he's living in like one of the richest neighborhoods of Seattle Medina uh, we definitely just kind of walked to Jeff or not Jeff what's his face uh, Bill Gates house and just back and at like two in the morning I get approached with him uh, by a Medina cop to make sure we weren't like smashing mailboxes or some shit we were just generally walking around because when I was partying at that time, I would like to just go and walk out in the in the area. But it made me very defensive because I'm a minority that obviously does not belong there. Um, generally, I look at the neighbors that my friend Sean was amongst, and it was general white middle class to upper class uh, families. And to have a minority kid just kind of walk at the streets at like two in the morning uh, caused a lot of questions. Uh, I believe it's increased. It's a lot because I don't have an accent. I blend in very well. And so the older I get, the more people I interact with, the less, the more surprising it is to them that I'm not a citizen or I'm not a natural born U.S. citizen with them. Yeah, I'd say there's definitely, there's that shift uh, when people figure out or assume that I'm an other. So there's definitely that changeover from, oh, the where are you from to the, the where are you from? I can. I've definitely had people ask where my accent's from or imply an ethnicity of some sort without directly saying it. So they're trying to figure out what's off about me. And so it feels very, uh, very much like they're trying to figure out where to box me, put me or how to label me to fit in with what they want. Yeah, yeah. Second, the second somebody finds out that I'm, you know, Portuguese or that my mother's African kind of thing, that it becomes that. How do you place or how do you decide where that person? How can they label what I should be now because I'm no longer just the guy at the table? I don't think it's been as big an issue until the most recent years, with the uh, more uh, immigrant conscious and kind of alt right. Um, literacy and, and vocabulary entering our discourse. So it's definitely changed more to being another, more than it used to be. 
I feel like my experience around being mixed race has varied a lot depending on the city that I'm in. Um, when I was living in New York City, a lot of people assumed that I was Dominican and would start speaking to me in Spanish. And when I very first got there, I was like 22 years old. I didn't know anything about the world. And I was like, what's happening? And it was very confusing to me. But then when I looked around my environment, because I was living in Washington Heights at the time, I was like, oh, I look a lot more like these people than I look like a black person. Um, so that was kind of interesting. And then I'd say here in Seattle, because there's just not a lot of diversity, it's not a specific identification of me as mixed race. They're just identifying me as not white, which I don't know if that's better or worse, but I don't necessarily feel like there's a lot of necessarily bias around it. It's just kind of like not white. I'm also in like art spaces. So I'll, like it's the product that matters. It's the music that matters. It's the stuff I'm emailing to someone that matters. Even in inner office workings or in restaurants with guests, it doesn't seem to affect me. I'm also maybe oblivious to a lot of stuff that could be ha like directed toward me, but I have seen very little negative interactions in my day to day. I work for like a big tech company, so I get lumped in with a bunch of tech people and I make a conscious effort to not look like them or interact like them or do anything that causes causes me to put uh be put into that kind of category because i know what they generally are seen as by local people and so it throws people off when i tell them like no i've been born and raised here and i do this and i work at this company and they get a little taken aback but i also feel like a an outsider uh for the most part just because um the best way I can put it is like I work for the empire and I have no problems with that. But the other part is like, I know what the, the territory is. If I name the company I work for, there's an assumed assumption that I'm a huge part of the problem. And I shouldn't be working for that company. Um, I wouldn't say it's made my life difficult, but it definitely has made me very protective of how I, explain kind of my story to people. Um, there's some stuff I'll just omit. Uh, some people like to speak on my behalf uh, about what I do. And, you know, I, I, they're my friends and I don't, I'm not gonna be a dick to them, but like, I prefer to not let people know what I do. And like, I'm not saying I'm ashamed of it. I just know there's inherent implications of when you get outed like that. And I kind of prefer to kind of leave that alone. Yes, definitely, now that I've come out, people do treat me differently. Uh, part of it is because I don't pass yet, and I know you don't have to pass to be valid. And I don't want to like 100% pass, but I want to be pretty close, I think. So I'm trying to work on my voice and all that. And, but I still feel way more comfortable outside now, because I was always afraid to draw any attention to myself sing or dance or anything on the sidewalk even though I always wanted to so now I can and most people have been really positive to me because you know it makes the world a more vibrant place yeah now that I have come out and realized I'm trans then I try and challenge other people to just show show myself as what I want to be and they can take it or leave it and at least I'm being myself so that's good for me and maybe the more I'm out, the more comfortable they'll become, they'll be more used to me, you know, wearing a skirt and stuff like that. And then they can be used to other people that might want to come out too. So part of the reason I'm more comfortable now is desperation because I'm already 36 now. So I'm like, I can't live forever. So I, I don't want to hide in the closet anymore. So I'm just, fucking breaking right out and you know if people don't like it too fucking bad uh so yeah uh i'm trying to just go out and be an example to other people so they can feel more comfortable to be out since i do have a little more confidence now and it's a bit fake it till you make it but 
I do have more confidence now and it, it is building up. The more I'm accepted by other people, like at work and at school, most people have been super welcoming to me. Work is a different environment and it depends on where where I'm working. I've worked at a, when I was living in Omaha, Nebraska, I worked at the pediatric hospital there. And at the time there were zero workplace protections for anyone who was not straight. And there is this old, very incorrect idea that people who are homosexual are child molesters. And it's a very conservative environment where even in the workplace, people who voted democratically had to be closeted and kind of silently seek each other out and come out as a liberal or Democrat. And I was definitely not out in that work environment because I did not trust that I was in a safe place to be out. Um, <clears throat> so the way that I interacted with my, in my work environment there was very different and not necessarily healthy. Um, while living in Seattle, I worked at a Starbucks where we had our one token straight person. And that was a fantastic work environment where I was able to interact and uh, just be myself all day, every day. And I really, truly enjoyed that experience. And I want to have that in my future um, work environments. My current employer, it's a little bit in between. It's this I'd say kind of progressive idea that yes, we want to be a welcoming, inclusive place for everyone, but the culture isn't quite there yet within the workplace. And I definitely limit myself and present myself in ways that I feel will allow me to move where I want to go and build the relationships I want to build within the workspace. Um, but it's not, I can tell that it's not as authentic as it was when I was working with my team of queer coworkers. Um, so it's, and I, again, haven't had any significant experiences in the workplace where people were um, treating me in ways that made me want to leave or to feel unsafe but there's always this mis this uh, lack of trust that my employer and my coworkers will um, treat me in a respectful way and in a um, affirming way. Around high school time, like, that's when I started like taking public transit because I went to a high school here on First Hill in downtown. So, you know, really at one point you just become a part of the public transit community and you take your bus in and out. So I did that for a while. And then uh, when I commuted from SeaTac, um, that's when I started getting used to like dealing with light rail and um, commuting just pretty much up to Capitol Hill to go to, to school for film and then just kind of getting around on foot because I didn't really have a car back then. And I was just used to that um, commute. The uh, the role that I put on when I'm out there is really just keep to myself, don't look like I'm a target for anything. Um, I always like kind of freak out when I see people rolling around with like really nice equipment, like cameras, just if they're tourists or just like really nice headphones. Um, just anything that has monetary value, I try to like uh, keep under wraps. Um, I used to uh, sleep really weird with it when I was rolling around with backpacks uh, in public transit a lot. Is I would um, do this thing if uh, if I was going to take a nap or fall asleep, which I'm luckily able to have that ability without being harassed. Uh, I would wrap my backpack around my leg. Um, like the the shoulder straps so if someone was going to try to physically strap like take it from me like i'd wake up to something um i usually choose the inside like the window side of whatever side of the bus i'm on or a public transit vehicle so like i kind of pin all my stuff into the wall so if they're gonna have to go go through me in order to grab whatever they want um, then i still kind of do it to this day but 
for the most part, like that's kind of just the mode I'm in. Uh, I can sometimes, um, well, not sometimes, but if I get on a route that I'm comfortable with, I'll be able to like pass out and just do my uh, rest before going into work or like drain after work. Um, if I'm in like a different uh, kind of city or a different route that I'll be way more alert in terms of like understanding my surroundings, figuring out where I need to get off at and kind of be aware of who's on that bus at that time. It's a lot of silent analyzing. Well, in public in general, I was always scared to basically be in public and draw any attention. Uh, and I now know that that was dysphoria. Uh, so I'm trying to just be out and proud and be myself, you know, and just kind of fight through it. Uh, but still, when I'm on the bus, like I just put my headphone in and just kind of keep my eyes downcast or out the window looking at the scenery. Or I just close my eyes and sort of nap a little, catch up on my sleep. Because, <laughs> yeah, uh, most people on the bus, they're either kind of weird themselves, but in a different way than me, and or they just don't even want to interact with me. And that's fine with me, usually. Uh, I'd rather make friends at work or school. I feel it most directly on the bus, like in the mornings. I'll, I spend a lot of time selecting my outfit, and I enjoy getting dressed, and I enjoy being fashion forward and I'll get on the bus and as I'm walking towards the back to find a seat, I just feel every head turning and being like, oh, and in my mind, I felt like I looked great, but then I'm kind of realizing other people think I look crazy or think I look ridiculous or, and this of course is my perception of like, maybe that's me putting it on them and assuming what they think of me. But a lot of times I think it's just that I'm wearing a really bright color or shiny pants or high heeled over the knee boots and nobody else on that bus is wearing anything like that. Walking to the back of the bus is more just for practical reasons because I don't like to stand. <laughs> so I want a seat on the way to work. Um, but there are days when I feel great and even when I feel those heads turn, I'm like, yeah, look at me. I look good. That's fine. You can look at me. Um, I think I learned it in part growing up. I'm thinking of a few situations when I was, so if I grew up outside New York City, I would go into New York City with my parents and family often. And there was one time in particular that I'm walking through Grand Central Terminal and this guy pointed at me and made creepy gestures and sound effects. And I was with my parents and that was like humiliating in a way that I really, sh it wasn't mine. Like it shouldn't have been my, my fucking fault. Um, but it, I think that among probably countless other experiences alone or with my family has, uh, made me sort of feel shamed about just getting attention. And, um, that probably contributes to being closed off. Um, but at the same time coming to Seattle, I feel like there's, um, another part of awareness that's opening up, which is like, I'm sort of kind of shedding the like slut shaming phase of my life. Like I feel, I find myself being more excited and proud of myself to just wear whatever the fuck I want and feel sexy and good in my skin too. And so it's kind of like a balance of sometimes I really don't fucking want the attention. Sometimes I feel empowered to be taking it for myself, but that doesn't change the fact that I don't want unwanted attention or interaction inappropriately. So for me, being an almost six foot tall woman, I've always been very conscious of the space that I take up and I've there's a lot of elements about me that are eye-catching. And so I've been pretty accustomed my whole life to like people turning their heads to look at me, being tall, being mixed race. Um, I do dress kind of fashion forward. Um, and 
being a beautiful woman, which I'm just going to say that. <laughs> um, I just, I draw a certain amount of attention and I have always. Um, I do, I'm kind of wanting to comment though on since having gone natural with my hair um, on the days that I'm wearing it out in like a full afro, I definitely feel a lot of eyes on me, additional eyes on me. Um, and I think a lot of that is just around uh, the novelty of it. It's becoming less novel, I think, as more women are adapting natural hair. It's not quite so conspicuous. Conspicuous? Is that the word? Um, but I definitely have noticed an additional level of attention that I draw when I have natural hair. I think as a woman, a lot of the times you don't love the attention that you're getting. It can be a lot of the male gaze and it's just kind of exhausting when you feel like a piece of meat and guys are just eyeing you up and down all day long. There's a lot of times that I wish that I wasn't so conspicuous, that I could blend in, that I wasn't drawing the attention that I do. Um, there's not a lot I can do about it though. Like being in this body, there's not a, a technique I can use to hide. I will never be able to hide in a crowd. There have been times probably like when I'm going out to a club or when I was single when I was going out and um, wanting to stand out that it was very easy for me to do that. And I would maybe depending on the venue, if I was going to a place where I knew it would be predominantly black people, I would like throw my hair as big as I could. Um, if I was going to a place where it wasn't going to be where it was going to be more like probably white people, I would still try to make myself stand out, but not necessarily with the big fro. Um, and I would say that there's definitely been times that I want to stand out and I'm very aware of how to do that, I guess. Hmm. I grew up with this mentality that the world is not a safe place. And I have tried very hard to feel invisible, whether or not I was invisible or not. The goal was always to not bring attention to myself. Um, <clears throat> and when I, as I've grown up and wanted to express myself more, I've definitely presented myself in ways that do garner attention. Uh, but there is always this psychological um, uh, experiment going on where I'm trying to not engage and not make eye contact and not necessarily be present with the people who aren't part of my circle that I'm in that environment with. And part of that is for a safety thing because if I can go unnoticed by those people then perhaps I will remain safe. I did have a manager who I was a, was a woman and I felt like she was very much threatened by me being a tall, confident, attractive woman. Um, I think that was a little more specific to her. I don't know if that's the case for a lot of people, if there is an element of threat or danger in just my physical presence, but pop, it could be. Uh, yeah, I mean, as a bigger dude, uh, I feel like I have to be a little bit more conscious about who I am and kind of where who, and how I'm moving. Uh, very easy for me to accidentally kind of close people in. Like if you're standing at the edge of a, an aisleway, you kind of block that off. Um, I think for a lot of most people just kind of accept being a bigger guy, especially with a deeper voice that a lot of things I say are just kind of taken for granted as far as they're acceptable or I can just say stuff at people and they believe it. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, as a hindrance as anyone on any kind of public transport, um, things are designed for people of a certain size range. Anything larger than that is of course hampering. Uh, but no, I mean, I help a lot of nice old ladies put away bags on airplanes and reach the uh, top shelf of stuff for anyone at any store. Yeah, I'd say it's, pretty standard that once you cross over like a certain acceptable or a certain 
outside of the norm that you're immediately noticeable as being X amount of person. I, I always listen to music in my ear, both to keep myself comfortable and to kind of create a barrier. And I have ever since I first got a Walkman back in like middle school. And I was playing tapes, you know, when I walked between classes, even though it was five minutes in school between classes, I'd listen to a song. And when I was walking down the hallway and I just kept my head down and just wove between all the other kids and I walked super fast. And cause I wasn't really friends with anyone and I, I knew I didn't fit in. So I just, I just didn't worry about it. And I just, cause music was always my friend because I love music. So yeah, it makes me more comfortable because I am a little on the spectrum. Uh, so music really calms me down and I still listen to it all the time. And I only have the one ear, so now that I have you know, a tattoo saying I'm deaf in this ear, <laughs> uh, because yeah, sometimes people don't see that you have an ear, head, earbud in this ear when they're looking on this side. So yeah, so it's, it's weird because yeah, I can't hear people if they're trying to talk to me over here. So I just kept my headphones in and keep my head down so then they don't even try to talk to me. Because I get tired of always like, what, what, what? You know, who's talking to me? So it's easier just not to make friends with strangers. Uh, yeah, grocery shopping, I I usually keep my headphone on there too because they have, you know, bad music playing or whatever. Uh, so I just kind of look at what I'm shopping for, you know, kind of like the bus. I keep my head down and just focus and try and ignore other people and they can look at me or not and I don't give a fuck. Yeah, but I am a little wary around other people still. And like in parks, you know, I see some people, you know, in the summer lay down and close their eyes, take a nap in the park on the grass. But I'm always too scared to do that. I like I close my eyes for a minute and then I got to look around to make sure no one's getting near me, sneaking up or anything, because you know, I'm a little wary. And that's the reason I don't get high in public either. I only get high at home because that just increased my paranoia. Uh, and it's not just the weed. It's just I'm already a little like that, already wary of other people. Because I, I find it really hard to trust other people. Mm. So moving to Seattle has been a very different experience for me uh, because there is this perception that, generally speaking, people are more relaxed about people expressing their individuality and people who might be different from them. Uh, that being said, when I do encounter people who I would describe as bros, uh, there is definitely this little alert that goes on. And my goal is to get out of that situation as fast as possible without drawing attention to myself in that process of escaping and also um, <clears throat> um, you know, just avoiding the situation altogether. So if I can see there's a group of individuals at the grocery store, uh, it, I feel like, um, I feel like grocery stores are a little bit different for me because I have a mission and I have five things that I'm there for. I go in, I get my things and I get out. Um, if I'm out on the street and I see a group of individuals that I consider to be potentially threatening, I will avoid them in whatever strategic way I can. So whether that's crossing streets early or later or continuing my movement in whatever direction I need to, to not um, potentially be exposed to a dangerous situation or a threatening situation, then I will take that extra action on myself. I definitely don't test those boundaries if I don't feel like it's going to be safe. And if I'm being completely honest, uh, male presenting humans are the most terrifying humans psychologically for me. So when I go into a space, if I see a person who looks like a straight male, I am going to immediately feel a little bit of discomfort. And if that person is a white straight male, I trust them the least to be open to understanding anything. Um, so when I go into a bar or a space, if I see someone acting in a stereotypical masculine heterosexual 
manner, I will seek out anyone who is different from that and gauge how comfortable they seem in that environment and take that as a small cue of how safe I will feel and can be in that environment. I immediately seek out, and I've been doing this ever since I realized that I was different, was, oh, I shouldn't say that. I don't like that phrase. And that people thought differently of you. I like that. Um, <clears throat> ever since I realized that people thought differently of me, I have immediately sought out people who I perceive as like me. And I will seek out the cashiers or the movie theater ticket people who I feel like I can be safe around. And those are the people that I will choose to interact with and choose to sit next to and be close to because um, I they give me a sense of safety when, generally speaking, there's always that question in my head of, am I safe? I think that the majority of the time I'm out in a public space, predominantly walking on a sidewalk or walking through a public place, if I'm by myself, I have tremendous blinders on because the amount of times that people I know who've had to snap me out of my resting bitch face, don't fuck with me mentality is like countless. So, and it's something that surprised me because I think of myself as being like an open, available person, but I, from these experiences, I realized that I'm very closed off when I'm by myself in a public space. And that's probably from a number of experiences of having men get, give me unwanted attention and interaction. Um, I think if it's a place that I'm familiar with and I'm going either with a purpose or expecting to see people I know, then I don't think I'm having that those blinders on, but if I'm walking through like Westlake Center or down third or something, then I do kind of close off. Um, and I think actually sometimes it is intentional, especially late at night. And I also do things that primarily I learned in St. Louis, like never walk with headphones in and never, you know, be distracted. And, um, and so part of that also includes staring people down on the street if they're walking, you know, against you and um, some things. I, I'd say that Seattle is pretty, um, compared to St. Louis, there's less chance. I don't fear being um, messed with as much as I did in St. Louis, but uh, I still try to be smart in that way. So I think if we're all going out and I'm with a group of friends on a weekend night and we're all going dancing and wearing dancing clothes, going from one place to another in a part of town where there's a lot of people doing something similar, then I'm not on guard in that way. If I'm by myself, maybe meeting people somewhere and, uh, you know, I might put on a coat so that I don't have to have the bus driver look at me or feel that the, <laughs> the bus driver be afraid that the bus driver might look at me or other people on the bus might look at me. And also when I'm alone, I tend to be ready to snap more at people. Like for example, if some guy, you know, some guy said to me like, well, come on, you know, cause I was doing resting bitch face and he was like, come on, smile. And I was like, I'm not fucking here for you. Like I have like those things queued up, <laughs> ready to go. Um, and I don't mind the East Coast coming out and showing that, st that stuff. I use that as a pedestrian just with cars as much as I do for like my uh, emotional safety, I guess, too. So as far as public, public places, right? Not selective groups. I, there are very few things I have to do different that I might not have thought of 20 years ago. Due to social climates as they are now, for example, when I am near police officers or law enforcement employees, I tend to take the earbuds out of my head, my, my uh, ears, and keep my hands out of my pockets. And that's just to show that I can hear things. And that's not only law enforcement, that's also if I see lights from an ambulance, 
like I take my earbuds out. I'm like, I want to know where it is. I don't want to be crossing the street at an inopportune time. Uh, my dad is military. He was also a cop and he was a cop for two years. He quit. He hated it. But he tells me like little things. He's like, it's, um, I'm not apologizing for anything, but there are certain things that happen that just, if you can hear someone asking you to do something, Especially if something like gnarly is happening, you know, Seattle is a very, very big city. And, you know, even in our little safe space of Capitol Hill, you know, there was a shooting over by Bar Sioux, this bar, you know, along the way just a few years ago. And that's psycho. I, I go to that bar. That's crazy. And if you weren't able to hear someone tell you, get down or like, hey, you know, hands up or something. I just want to be able to be there. It's unfortunate that not everybody has this mindset, but yes, I'm a brown person. Yes, I have an Afro and gun violence does exist. And it is not, it is uh, proportionally not in my favor to not be aware of stuff like that. So yeah, even my pops, like years ago when I moved to LA, he's just like, just listen, please be respectful. Don't make them have a bad day. You know, they got enough going on for themselves. And I kind of always like just thought of that. You know, I'm not trying to pick fights with them. I'm not trying to pick fights with anybody. Uh, I, I feel like you should treat law enforcement people like you would at a host at a restaurant, you know? It's just that the repercussions will be way worse, you know? A host at a restaurant is not going to arrest you. I think I'm actually pretty, pretty self-centered uh, in terms of I don't even want to deal with me. So I'm pretty uh, standoffish. I kind of keep to myself. I don't try to like make eye contact. Um, I hold a lot of um, of what my parents taught me. My mom was a King County, a former King County Sheriff, and they had that weird paranoia. It's like, don't dress flashy, don't look like you have expensive things on you, don't constantly be around or aware of your surroundings. Um, you know, it's it's weird. Like now that I'm like a, a full on adult, when I was being taught these concepts from like a teenage to now. Like a lot of it was like probably unfounded paranoia. My mom, who uh, when I was uh, growing up in West Seattle, uh, notoriously Delridge uh, around the uh, South Seattle area, my mom was working the beat at White Center. And generally the neighborhoods I grew up in weren't like really, I wouldn't say they, were, they weren't safe, but they weren't like the ideal neighborhood that people wanted to live in. It was like, you want to live in a suburb, but you can't afford like the nicer areas, um, which was funny because I feel like West Seattle before, you know, the mass um, of gentrification that happened, there was still a pretty gentrified neighborhood to begin with. I mean, I lived uh, on Delridge since 1993 um, and that neighborhood shaped a lot over the times. I remember there was a, a, a murder that's still being investigated um over at the shell gas station on off of delridge uh, across the street ironically from the police station before that was there but i think my mom's uh kind of experiences of dealing with uh white center and beery and kind of like that neighborhood before that even cleaned up there was a lot of paranoia instilled through her into me where i wasn't really allowed to hang out with the, you know the neighbor children in the area who were apparently gang affiliated or something to that effect so my mom kind of created this like anti-social measure like kind of built into how i am which some days i kind of want to kind of keep everyone at arm's length um much to weird contradictions of how people have perceived me through meeting me um, people think i'm very easy approached uh, approachable and stuff like that but for the most part i kind of take in the situation as it comes slowly letting people in but there'll be a point where i'll just kind of cut it off um or if they're that if i find out they're not like complete idiots or someone that i just don't want to be like i i could tolerate then they'll be let in further but for the most part i kind of have a really high filter but i play it off as such where people don't really understand um and they'll take it as a joke and they'll bring it in further but that's not the point, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think there's a there's an instilled uh, kind of xenophobia that my mom kind of put into me um, just because everyone could be out to get whatever. My mom was very materialistic and wanted to protect everything that she owned. 
And I think her over paranoia in that aspect and also working as a cop or a sheriff um, kind of heightened that to a really unhealthy extreme. Living in Seattle has been a very relaxing experience in that way. The places I've lived before, I definitely spent more of my time and my energy trying to go unnoticed. And here I see more people who are their authentic selves and who are expressing themselves in ways that um, is bold and brave and uh, inspires me to cross over these self-defined boundaries that um, I feel like I need to remain safe. I feel like my experience around being mixed race has varied a lot depending on the city that I'm in. Uh, when I was living in New York City, a lot of people assumed that I was Dominican and would start speaking to me in Spanish. And when I very first got there, I was like 22 years old. I didn't know anything about the world. And I was like, what's happening? And it was very confusing to me. But then when I looked around my environment, because I was living in Washington Heights at the time, I was like, oh, I look a lot more like these people than I look like a black person. Um, so that was kind of interesting. And then I'd say here in Seattle, because there's just not a lot of diversity, it's not a specific identification of me as mixed race. They're just identifying me as not white, which I don't know if that's better or worse, but I don't necessarily feel like there's a lot of necessarily bias around it. It's just kind of like not white versus mixed race. I don't know. It honestly didn't feel that much different to me, like walking through a street in Italy didn't feel that much different to me than walking down a street in New York. The amount of attention that I would draw or the heads that would turn, even in Taiwan when I lived there, it felt about the same as anywhere I'd been. Um, with the exception of Prague, I did a trip to Prague. It was part of a three week Europe trip that I had done and I was traveling solo. And the amount of stares and just open mouth gaping that I experienced from people was like the most intense that I've ever had, even more than Taiwan or more than like Japan. Um, and it was actually quite unnerving. The first day I was there, I'd be on the subway and I would feel people like across from me, just like staring at me and not stopping. They're just like, just like mouth agape, staring, like full on staring. And initially I was really kind of like upset and kind of trying to like change my demeanor to be like, I can't do anything about my height or like sticking out like it is what it is. Um, but then on the second day I was really angry. Like how dare these people make me feel like a zoo animal, like I, deserve to be here, I'm blah, blah, blah. So I wore a purposely kind of provocative dress that wasn't really that bad. It was just like fitted and kind of sexy. And I wore my hair just as big as I could possibly make up, make it. And I put on just like really heavy makeup. And my mentality was kind of like, if you're gonna stare at me, I'm gonna give you something to stare at. And so I was just like strutting through the streets, like turning even more heads than the day before. And but when I would feel people staring at me, I would stare back like really aggressively, just like, <gasps> just like staring back at them. And it was really kind of fun to freak people out by doing that. But I would say that's probably the most other I've ever felt was in Prague. I mean, there's generally like a lot of unwritten rules in whatever city you're in, but I think Seattle's basic thing is just social interaction. So many different like kind of like constructs in there. I wouldn't say hierarchies, but there's definitely constructs of how people from outside of Seattle interact with people um, with uh, Seattle lights or how Seattle lights interact with each other. Um, I will say it's very interesting that I made a lot of friends who are not local to Seattle and maybe I'm just some weird, like kind of um, 
anomaly. But generally, most Seattleite people are just like very close knit to the point where they don't really like outsiders as much as they try to include people. Without my tinfoil hat and my bowl of granola, I will say that energies are absolutely infectious. Like, it's not quantified. There's no math behind it. But once again, having come from Hawaii and anybody that's visited there, there's just a different vibe there. And there's different, there's different vibes everywhere. You know, uh, as much as I liked visiting Japan, there, there's like certain elements about it that seem a little less social, which doesn't make any sense because like Tokyo is one of the densest na- like cities in the world. And it's kind of crazy. No one's making eye contact. There's no light conversation. Whereas, oh my gosh, I'm so privileged. Um, <laughs> well, otherwise, when I was in Rome, it's almost the opposite. Everybody's talking. It's definitely less dense. And there just seems to be a different energy about it. Where, I mean, those are different places doing different things. Rome is definitely a destination location. Everybody's taking pictures and eating food. And especially in downtown Tokyo, people got work to do. It's not that they're being rude or they don't want to talk to you. They got seven minutes to get to the office and make their money so that they could support their families. And I totally understand that. But just the feel of those places are different. Yeah, in my experience, and once again, I've mostly experienced West Coast United States. That's been most of my life. So I've got it really easy. This would be a completely com- different conversation if you're talking to someone who was born and raised in like Mississippi or, you know, anywhere where this is such a difficult subject to talk about. You know, I got buddies from Tennessee. I got, I got yeah, black folk from Tennessee. I got buddies that grew up in Atlanta and their experience from in, in high school is like disheartening to me. And I'm like, that sounds so rough. No wonder you left. No wonder you're in Seattle now. And, like, and I, you know, now just even talking about this out loud, I'm really curious what they think about it now. If they, how much they miss about home or if they're like ran away screaming and never going back. Once again, it's been really easy in Seattle. When I'm on tour with my band and we're in other cities like Boise or somewhere in Montana or we were in Leavenworth where it's a little less diverse, it's a little strange for me, uh, you know, seeing MAGA hats and a lot of camo is a little shocking. And I just try to keep that in my awareness, you know, maybe don't pick a fight with that one. Just oh, don't pick a fight with anybody. Come on, be kind. But just definitely more aware socially about stuff like that when I'm in other cities. But to be completely honest, not so much in Seattle. I feel like the East Coast, the Northeast at least, everything was out on the surface and people would communicate with you really brusquely and like straightforwardly and if you know not to take it in a personal way, I think it's really refreshing and just kind of more chill because <laughs> you're not having to interpret something. Um, I'm always, ref- I find myself being refreshed when I go back and experience that for a little bit in the Midwest, but it's not as friendly in New York. People aren't just like saying hello, but if they need to communicate, it's pretty direct. In the Midwest, I felt that, um, people were saying hi to you on the street. Like you were just, it was suddenly threatening. Now like people are being friendly to you out of nowhere. So that was a lesson to learn. But I also do like the racial dynamics changed a lot. So there is also a different awareness in that. And probably it would be like, I I mean, it's probably true that it was white people saying hi to white people and maybe not across races. And um, I just, that tension was there in a crappier way. Um, Seattle, Seattle is back to sort of being like no one communicates, but also people don't communicate even when they could or maybe should. It's like reading between the lines and um, I don't know. I, f- I find myself being an outlier communicating directly sometimes. Time is not enough. Time 
is not going to change perceptions of anyone. It's the experiences that people have within that time and the changes that occur within that time frame. I don't think that the public is going to be able to just miraculously change themselves. It's, again, the experiences that the public collectively has that will change things. And my real question is, what kind of changes are needed to shift the public experience and the public perception? And I don't know what that is. I think that it's addressing, likely addressing many of the fears and struggles that everyday people have and bringing a sense of shared experience among everyone. Um, but how we can make that happen, I don't know. For me, interacting in spaces in any of those places, I do feel empowered and there is a potential to just make connections with people and still have a you know split second moment of sharing a laugh about some other thing that's going on in front of us that we can relate to and then that fleeting moment ends and that stranger goes off forever i just like um maybe that's true across the board just the ability to despite all the insecurities and potential fears still um seize the ability to try to connect with someone on the level of humanity in every place uh, I mean, I think it'll soften naturally uh, as long as we can kind of take uh, take advantage of the momentum of the language and change that as opposed to letting the current system decide how we use words. Um, if we can get ahead of that, then we can prevent that language from making more people outed as others. But I would like to share a hope in, in terms of like the mixed race piece of it. I would love for there to be a day when it's not a topic when it's not a question. What are you shouldn't be a question that people have to answer. And I have to answer that question frequently. Um, I don't know how to fix that, but I hope that sometime in the future, it will be irrelevant what color you are, where you're from or that type of thing.